okay, we're going to go, because we're going to go. Good evening. Welcome to the March 2021 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Ju Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, let us begin with introductions. I will go around my screen, and if you would, at that moment, unmute yourself and introduce yourself, that would be lovely. Jeff Jones, let's start with you. Uh, Jeff Jones, um, I guess you'd say essay appointee um, at large. Thank you. Chris Loris. Uh, Roger, Christopher Loris, I am here uh, in two capacities, one as the uh, representative for Crime Research Group for Karen Gannett and Robin Joy, and I'm also a member of the Criminal Justice Council. Thank you. Judge Grierson. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Good to see everyone. Yes, thank you. Loretta Saki. Hi, Loretta Saki from the <laughs> Council of State Governments Justice Center. Thank you. Thank you. Pepper. Hi, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you. Tyler Allen. Good evening, everybody. Tyler Allen from Department of Children and Families. Great. Jen Furpo. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jen Furpo, the designee for the Vermont Police Academy. Great. Monica Weber. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I'm the designee for the Department of Corrections. Thank you. Elizabeth Morris. Hi, all. I am Elizabeth Morris, I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator for DCF. Jessica Brown. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Brown. My pronouns are she and her, and I am an Attorney General's Office appointee to this panel, and I am also the Managing Attorney for the Public Defender Office for Chittenden County. Thank you. Julie Scribner. Hi, I'm Julie Scribner. I'm a captain with the Vermont State Police, co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs on behalf of Commissioner Sherling. Thank you. Uh, David Scher. David Scher, Assistant Attorney General and designee for the Attorney General's Office. Thank you. Julio? I am uh, Julio Thompson. Uh, a director of the Civil Rights Unit in the Attorney General's Office. I'm not on the RDAP, I'm just here as an observer. Great. Thanks. Oh, look, Falco. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Falco Schilling, Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. And I am also not on the RDAP, but I'm here as an observer as well. Great. Thanks. Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner. A uh, panel member from the Office of the Defender General. Great. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lalong. Uh, yes, hello, Eitan. Martin Lalone, uh, representative. I'm on the Judiciary Committee and I'm uh, observing. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, uh, I don't know what to do when it says plus two. There are two other people out there, apparently. If I have not called your name, because God forbid this should be a user-friendly platform, um, please feel free to just introduce yourself now. I know there are at least two of you. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Oh, look there. Hi. <laughs> Hello. The Susanna Davis Racial Equity Director for the State. I normally attend these meetings in that capacity, but tonight I'm joining you as the chair of the Racial Equity Task Force. Thank you for having us. And I'm sorry if I came in unmuted uh, at the beginning and interrupted people's introductions. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else that I have not, that I cannot access? Mercedes Avila, I, hi. <laughs> 
I have issues with teams. And um, I'm a social professor of pediatrics at UVM College of Medicine, and I serve as a community member in the Racial Equity Task Force. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Anyone else who I'm unceremoniously not introducing? Okay, I am sorry about that, and allow me to uh, welcome all of you who are from the Racial Equity Task Force. Thank you for coming. Um, look forward to talking with you. Um, sorry about the inelegant introductions, but that's technology for you. Um, oh, right. I'm Eitan Nasred Longo. I'm chair of the panel. Um, moving on, I'd like to switch a few things around because I somehow got all screwed up when I wrote the agenda. I'd like to do the announcements. Um, does anyone have any? I have one, but I'd like everybody to go first. Any announcements? No? Okay. Um, what I wanted to point out, you have learned, and certainly by this point in time, that there's always a difficulty with notifying people, or I have a difficulty. Let me personalize it. I have a difficulty with notifying you all when I have to testify somewhere. It's my problem. And Sheila has solved the problem. Um, text messages. I don't know why this seemed impossible, but I don't think sometimes. And I forget about cell phones. And she recommends that people who want to be notified about testimony um, Send me, well, I mean, I think this is what we should do, is send me your name, your phone number, in an email. I will make a whole group on my phone, and then I can just send out a text message when I am going to be testifying. Um, and I think that that was a really great solution. She does that herself with the root, um, and it, it, she puts me in a group that it, all the time, and I didn't make the connection because I just didn't. So anyway, again, I'm sorry that this has been a problem up until now, but thanks to Sheila for coming up with a really easy and obvious solution to the problem. So um, that's my one announcement, is that we can do that from here on out when I testify. Um, any questions, comments, anything, please chime in. Okay, approval of the minutes, discussion. Anybody got anything to say about that? The minutes. Everybody loves them? Cool and make groovy. a motion to approve the, mi the minutes. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone seconding that? This is Jessica, I'll second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstaining? Minutes are accepted. Thank you. And thank you again, Olivia, um, for taking our minutes for us. Um, also, I have gotten a request. Could people please also remember to mute themselves if they're not yeah, speaking? Because like, I really would love to get... Um, we would... Re yeah, that mute thing. It's a marvelous tool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what? Let's move into the body of the meeting, the discussions. I want to switch the first two items so that the Racial Equity Task Force people can leave early if they so desire, if they don't want to be here through the rest of our uh, deliberations. Um, so we have, as you know, then the inquiry from the Racial Equity Task Force concerning collaboration on racial justice, uh, criminal justice reform and law enforcement. And for this, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Executive Director Davis. So, Susanna, it is, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you. So uh, a number of you who were on, I think, last month's call 
um, might remember the brief rundown that I gave you, um, but I'll, I'll kind of lift that back up again. The Racial Equity Task Force, as you know, um, was established by executive order in the summer of 2020, and the governor asked us to look at three specific items. One was about uh, fair representation, getting more people of color into uh, public office. Uh, at all levels of state government, including boards and commissions. The next one was systems of support that exist in Vermont for communities of color in general. And the third was free speech, hate speech, et cetera. We delivered two reports that covered those three topics. But the first one is the one I wanna focus on, that's systems of support for communities of color in Vermont. And one of the biggest uh, systems that, that exists with, you know, and the one with which people of color interact often most negatively is the justice system in all of its stages. And um, the task force made a very thoughtful but difficult decision not to tackle policing in that report because we felt that given the runway that we had and the deadlines that had been established, we wanted to be able to do that topic justice and give it the, the consideration that it needed. And we didn't think that coupling it with all the other systems of support, et cetera, in one report would, would give us enough time or thoughtfulness to do that. So we tabled the policing discussion, though we did have a lot of feelings about, uh, about criminal justice in general. So after we completed the deliverables in the executive order, we turned our attention back to the items that we had set aside, and this was one of them. Uh, we knew that the RDAP existed and was extremely prolific putting out reports and recommendations and having press conferences and testifying left and right. And you all have been very busy in this space. And I think one of the things that we can all agree on is that nobody wants to do double work and nobody wants to be, um, you know, zagging when we should be zigging. So uh, we thought it best to communicate with the RDAP so that we could let you all know what our early thinking was on criminal justice issues whether there were topics that you had explored, had not explored, that we could tackle and let you know what our thinking was as we begin to turn our attention to this topic. And I uh, have Mercedes and I think Stefan is also on. So please feel free to, to jump in to correct or add. Um, so that's kind of where we are. I'm, I'm grateful to you all for hosting us at this meeting so that we could maybe talk a little bit about if there's an opportunity for collaboration between the two groups, what that could look like, or if you just have general thoughts about um, how we can or should approach some of these topics. Um, just as a quick, quick rundown, some of the items that we had been considering early in our thinking include things like police in school, SROs, um, and just generally about law enforcement contact with students, um, use of force, body-worn cameras, and that slate of issues, which we deliberately didn't touch because at the time, DPS and ACLU and the other partners had been um, floating around a couple of 10-point plans, and we didn't want to have to jump in there unnecessarily. Um, things like testing and vaccinations for incarcerated people and also out-of-state incarceration. So um, as you can see, we're kind of talk, touching on multiple stages of the justice system, incarceration, policing, et cetera. So uh, that's those are some of the issues that we started identifying early on, and I want to make sure that I um, invite Mercedes and Stefan to add to that if I've missed anything, but that's kind of where we are. You're I good. Think that's I was in. Go ahead. Somebody was about to speak. Sorry. No? I just said, I, I, I think that Susana covered everything. Thank you. Ah, uh, OK. Thank I you. Saying, I was saying the exact same thing at the exact same time. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, and hello. <laughs> hey. So from, do you have a report, Susana, that you all are doing on criminal just that you're you have as a deliverable that you would like some of collaboration on these topics to inform so we haven't necessarily i don't think we've necessarily settled on drafting a report but we had thoughts and we needed to get them down or at least talk them through so we haven't necessarily identified a deliverable or a timetable for that um, I think what we really wanted to do was establish 
a, a firm desire and, and a set of parameters for whether and how we have this conversation as a group. So as of now, there's, there's not necessarily a specific report planned, but I don't know, maybe, um, I don't mean to speak too much for the group without deeper conversation, but I, I imagine that whatever deliberations we have will probably result in something on paper. Um, and I guess, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned one more thing. Um, we're considered advisory to the governor, and so most of our recommendations are oriented toward what that office can do. Some of them call for legislation, uh, but for the most part, we try to make them as actionable as possible to the entity to whom they're to be delivered. Okay, thank you. Um, discussion from the rest of the panel? From Everyone's very quiet. Susanna, this is Rebecca. I'll, I'll chime in first. Thanks for uh, being here, the members of your group. It's great to hear you, what your work and the overlap, and, and um, I certainly personally agree. I don't want to zag when we could zig <laughs> together. Um, what, I, what, I, what I do think would be helpful for me, because I just heard you, um, and uh, say say the things that you guys were working on that could potentially overlap, but it would be helpful to see that in writing more, or or maybe we can discuss it here more if you're ready to share. But I I, I got one. I mean I'm I'm not quite sure what you are. Uh, you have seen our report, uh, I'm sure, in November 2019, not the most recent one where we made all these suggestions has. Has your group considered that report in terms of whether there's any identified overlap, overlap in interest? We haven't dived, dived deep into it, um, mainly because we were trying to pump out all of these recommendations specified by governor, and we had decided to table the topic generally. But, um, but the RDAP reports are have definitely served as kind of a, a, a starting point in general for where I think the state is now. So for example, a lot of the stuff that came out of justice reinvestment and out of this group are, are moving through the legislature. And so it's with that context that we consider, is there anything else that needs to be added or changed? Um, so I guess the short answer is not yet, but, uh, but we're getting there. And I suppose that's a real part of the reason that we are here um, as a way of exploring, are there stones that you all didn't, um, that you all either didn't have time or resources or anything like that to overturn that perhaps we could help look at or something like that? I would think we, I would, I have now officially forgotten our report from 2019. <laughs> I, I don't know how that's possible given how many times I presented it, but I do, I have officially forgotten it. And I, I'm wondering, given that we were thinking of amplifying that entire body of work going forward, whether any of this fit into that report and that we should, you know, start pulling out on that. Rebecca, you're nodding. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm nodding and also trying to buy some time because I also, I, I, I agree. I think that would be a natural place where if we could find some overlapping areas that we don't um, can get there quickly, Susanna. Um, the other point, which maybe it's a correlation of what you're saying, but it's a bit of the opposite, which is we want to be efficient. We also don't want to be in conflict, right? And I wanted to highlight, because um, I haven't had a chance to, we haven't just talked about this with this panel, but some of the uh, bills that have been introduced this session, uh, I've been testifying, uh, and Representative Lalonde knows he sees a lot of things these days, um, 
on behalf of the Office of Defender General on some of the bills. One of those bills, why it's relevant to bring up here, and specifically in the context of conflict, potentially, is, uh, and this is where I was buying time, the bill related to amending the hate crime uh, statute, which is a sentencing enhancement. And during my testimony uh, opposing that bill, I shared uh, some of the history that our panel has had uh, the early days history, and Aitan, I don't know if this was before your time or, or, or after, um, but the ones who have been on this panel from the very beginning will recall that this discussion did come up, that it is not included in our 2019 report. Uh, and the point I made was that wasn't uh, a coincidence, right, that it was something that we discussed. So. That is just but one example, and and Susanna, I should share with everyone. You also testified uh, there as well, and you can share what you'd like as to your testify or testimony or not on it. But uh, that is an instance where not only do I hope we can find common areas so that we're efficient, but that we're not in conflict on on what is sort of the highest priorities the most important places where we think that real reform can be made. And so therefore be on sort of the same front so that the legislature who has just such finite resources as do we, but they themselves, I haven't ever appreciated as much as I have been up close with this committee, uh, this session, how much they are doing and working. Um, but to me, that's a point where we can be very helpful to them. Right, where we can identify, yes, that may be an interest to some, but is that a priority for RDAP? Is that a priority for this task for your task force? And if so, why? And what is it that we're really shooting? Like, what are the common underlying fundamental principles that's driving our work, our particular proposals for? So I think there is a theme there um, that has developed. Great. Thank you. Sheila. Hey, everybody. Sheila Linton, Community at Large, Root Social Justice Center, she, her pronouns. Thank you, Aton. Thank you, Susanna, for being here. And thank you, Rebecca, for your comments. I, um, What I'm thinking about, I have the similar questions and needs um, as what Aton and Rebecca requested, sort of more of the body to look at our work, as well as for us as a group to look at that work and see if where we need to tweeze things out more. I think in making that body of work that we did, there were numerous things that we wanted to expand on that were not exactly our focus of this group. And I think like we just, I what I'm sort of hearing, I don't wanna put words in other people's mouths, but I think like we just haven't gotten together as a panel to be like, okay, what are those things that we couldn't really focus on because it wasn't the priority to get the report out to the legislature? And what are those extending things from that report that we really feel as though maybe this group might have better jurisdiction in, might have more capacity, might have more resources, whatever it might be, or might be just collaborative with us in making some of those things happen. Some of those things for me, I can't speak for the panel, I'll speak for myself as a member on the panel, but also in the conversation in which we had, and other people feel free to chime in and either correct me or give your own opinion of these things. But um something that I'm really interested in is going upstream. And I think that's a lot of what the panel had talked about as when we started really tweezing things out, we started getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, what's not downstream, but what's really upstream. So specifically talking about, for me, like mandated reporters and things where, where do things start and why are things happening and when are they happening? So we talked about things like mandated reporters. We talked about things like um, resource officers or police in schools. We talked about the DCF office and juvenile um, and juvenile justice. And so for me as a panel member, I would like this body to support on those three initiatives. I would like to be finding out more about mandated reporters and training and data and understanding specifically how explicit and implicit bias is happening and what's happening around man all the different types of mandated reporters. I would really like to support not only here locally in the Brattleboro area, but statewide with the ethnic coalition and supporting the um, resource officers out of schools. And I think that would be 
really great if we could come together on that because we are not only part of that statewide with many different entities that are BIPOC led working on that body of work, but it's like a whole statewide thing, but very localized at the same time. And I think, again, it's that upstream work that we're talking about when we talk about transformative justice or restorative justice, we keep on coming back to like, well, where does this start? Starts in school, starts in that mandated reporter that maybe it's not in school, starts at DCF when they're getting their children taken away or being questioned without an adult or whatever the situations are. And then the last, I know that there's a bill, I think it's still H265, which is for the Office of Child Advocate, I believe. And I am really a huge proponent of that. And Families United here in Brattleboro, which is a part of the root, and others, um, as well as, of course, um, Voices for Vermont's Children, and many others are working on this from around the state and have provided testimony on it. And I would really, really like us to continue to focus on oversight and accountability for the DCS system. It's not only really important for obvious reasons that we're talking about the um, adult criminal juvenile system, but it's also really important to address the upstream issues that we're talking about. And that would be absolutely my focus, um, in my opinion, for this panel. Anyone else? My sense is that what we ought to do is um, look at those the issues that Susanna's has put out and look at what we've done in the 2019 report and look at the overlap and start from that point. That seems like the best way to proceed to me. I would love other feedback. That's a time going off the cuff. I say that because that was sort of the direction we're moving in. If you look at our agenda for the evening, we haven't yet gotten it, uh, the discussion of readings from Julio and Rebecca Turner concerning civilian oversight models from law enforcement. That was the beginning of that effort to go back to the report from 2019 and begin sort of deepening it, making it a closer look. Um, I would suggest that the issues that Susanna and the Racial Equity Task Force bring out, uh, police and schools, the use of force issues, traffic stops, certainly, I mean, that all sort of fits in, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, with our report from 2019. Not so much the um, testing and vaccinations, obviously, um, for incarcerated people, um, but I, the issue of out-of-state incarceration is not too much of a stretch from where we were um, to discuss. We were also very clear that there would be disagreement on this level, that we were going to get to reports that uh, included a lot of dissent, probably. Um, I keep remembering Jessica Brown saying that it was, you know, we were able to come to consensus on the report in 2019 because it really was from 30,000 feet. And when we got down to oh, I don't know, let's say 10, it's probably going to be less consensual. So I guess I'm suggesting that we take a look at suturing this into um, the tw our work on the 2019 report, and I will, I'll start that. I'll take the report and look at the list of concerns and put them together in a document that I will then send out by email to everyone. Does that sound like a reasonable way to proceed? Does that also, Susanna and members of the, I can't, R-E-T-F, sorry, I gotta go slow on that one. Um, does that make sense to you, everybody? I just need feedback. I just put a proposal together. Jessica's giving me a thumbs up, so I'm happy. Sheila's <laughs> giving me a thumbs up. All right. I, yes, I was going to say yes. Thumbs up. yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then I will do that, um, folks. I will I will sit down with the computer and I will take the concerns because um, Susanna and I have been in, in contact over this. And so I will suit your stuff in um, and, like, say, here's this part of our report from 2019. Let's, you know, this would seem to fit here. Let's start these discussions from this point. Yes? Cool and groovy. 
is there great. any and I just Go ahead. want to add one more which is I rattled off a couple of subtopics um but you know again our our conversations had been tabled and so it it our thinking wasn't necessarily limited to that. So um, one thing that I appreciate about this conversation is it feels as if we're coming to you saying, hey, we didn't have enough runway to do policing stuff, um, but we want to. Can we help you or can you help us? And then it sounds like you're also saying, hey, when we did our policing stuff, we didn't have enough runway to do ancillary stuff that you may have been working on. And so I think I agree with really finding those intersection points and, and I think this is a great opportunity. Um, I will also send you the summary of the recommendations that we've made, a number of which do touch on this, like um, school discipline, et cetera. And, um, and I also note that a couple folks who are generally at RDAP meetings also have seats on the task force. So the ACLU has a seat on the task force, the HRC, et cetera. And so I, I, I think there's probably a lot, of, a lot of those common points that we could identify. Great. And when you send me that summary, then I will also send it out to the entire RDAP so that you guys see it. I'll, in other words, I'm just going to, what? No, I, I will do that. And I think I can actually put it here in the chat now. Oh, well, but I, will also, I right. will also send it secretly by email because I know that that's easier sometimes. Yeah, you know how good I am with the chat. So, uh, <laughs> so yes, if you would put it in email, that would be great. Thank you. So we'll start there then and move from that point forward. Any other comments people want to make? All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad you all came. I'm hoping this will be a very fruitful collaboration. It looks like it's going to get off very well because even that there are a lot of overlaps. So thank you for coming. Feel free to stay. I mean, I'm not, you know, <laughs> we're going to keep going. So, but we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Uh, as I said, we had, um, I had moved a couple things around because I, I wanted to get the racial equity task force folks in so they didn't have to be here for our whole meeting. Um, I wanted, this is part an announcement, part not. Um, I want to let you know that I was asked to testify on March 11th, which is the day after tomorrow, concerning the repeal of the sunset of the RDAP. Um, as you have in your, um, and on the, on the agenda, the bill S97, uh, I have you know, there's a link there and you can look at it. Um, I'll be testifying at 8:30 in the morning. Um, bring some coffee. Uh, Judge Grierson will be testifying. Pepper will be testifying. David Sher will be testifying, and then me. Um, you may remember regarding the repeal of the sunset that this was an issue that Representative Brad brought up last month at our meeting, um, and that this concern has now become part of this bill of S-97. And as I say, testimony will be taken on this on Thursday. Um, I personally feel that we run fine. <laughs> I mean, there are some kinks and some of them have to do with the pandemic, with the intrusion of technology into something that ought to be in a room. But I don't feel like there's a major screw up here on some levels. Um, there is one issue that absolutely does come to mind to me and that I'm hoping to testify about, and that would be the need for a fairly stable link between the RDAP and the legislature. And I say that because, as you guys learned from my emails the last month, um, there was a lot of, I don't know, people were asking me really good questions about what had become of the bill that we looked at last meeting, the draft, and I really didn't know. And that's no one's particular fault. It's just because things get going, everyone has things that they do, and if there are roads that need to move in directions they're not familiar with, they don't tend to happen. So what, I'm going, what I would like to say um, on Thursday is, 
yes, this is a lovely idea. We're all for it. And by the way, we need to talk about some kind of link so that communication comes to me. I mean, I've been sitting pretty much on this cushion, on this couch, in this room for 12 months, and it's really difficult to get information. So I don't always, my usual, um, you know, Montpelier moles, as it were, are not as functional right now as they are when we're not all sitting on the same couch, on the same cushion, and so on. So I just feel like I want to suggest that when I testify. Um, uh, if anything occurs to you, if anything pops to your mind right now, could you please just shout it out? Because I'd like to know. My plan is to speak of our concerns as kind of a list that I can present to, this is going to be to the Senate Judiciary Committee, by the way, um, I, that I would like to give them a list of concerns that we have that they may want to take up. Um, so feel free to discuss. Anybody got stuff? Anything that pops to mind? Pepper. Eitan, one, one thing that I was thinking about when we submitted our most recent report was that the enabling statute that created us uh, had very specific um, reporting requirements. And yes. I don't pretend that we've, you know, achieved any of those goals per se, but we have reported on all of them um, to some degree or another. And I wonder if, if we're going to repeal the sunset, um, whether it makes sense to relook at, rethink about our enabling statute, to think about other areas that we might want to try to weigh in on um, as a panel. Um, you know, even if it's as simple as, you know, working with the racial equity task force on um, just kind of a broader criminal justice reform strategy or so something, you know, I, I just, it was very specific about data collection, and I remember there's like three or four parts. Uh, and data I feel like was we, a bit, yeah, right. And and you know they haven't necessarily acted on all of our recommendations, but if we just sit here and keep recommending the same things, uh, I, I don't, I don't know how useful that will be for for our time. Um, so I wonder if part of the recommendation, maybe it's part of the conversation here tonight, or just moving forward is. What do we want that kind of next step to look like? Okay. Anyone else? Hey, Pepper. Uh, this is this is Don. <clears throat> My question for you, though, is we're looking at that. Should should that be expanded a little bit instead of it always being reported to the legislative bodies that maybe there's a way to also work with local law enforcement or other type of agencies to make policy changes so it's not all legislative but it could be recommendations uh with with the uh, law enforcement courts juvenile justice whatever uh you know i i just didn't know if maybe it should be expanded or just stay with legislative you know i, I actually think that's a great idea I mean, um, so much of, you know, the disparities that we see around the state are due to, you know, uh, I would say kind of disparate resources and, you know, people acting locally uh, and there being a disconnect, honestly, between the legislature and the kind of local communities. So I, I think some direction for us in that, in that realm would be uh, welcome, at least from my perspective. Okay. Yeah. Because, like, personally, from my end, you know, we I would love uh, that DCF and the core systems recognize the Indian Child Welfare Act. I mean, I get contacted with, with uh, courts and DCF from all over the country except one, Vermont. And I don't know why that is, but it just happens. But it would be nice to be able to work with those agencies directly to make changes so that way maybe they do extend those those laws to state recognized tribes and other type of things uh anyway that's just a just a suggestion thanks pepper can i ask you a favor then yes and that pepper's like you can ask but you may not get it. um could you 
right what you just said about re looking again at the enable at the um, statute that brought us into being and that gave us direction. Could you please put that into a small paragraph and shoot that to me? Yes, of course. That would be lovely. I would yeah. appreciate that. Hey, Tom, if I can ask a yes, question. Judge Grimson. Back to uh, Chief Stevens. Um, Chief, I'm, I'm curious, in, in what context have you had to reach out to other other states and in what respects hasn't the court responded to your concerns? It's not I've reached out to them. Under the Indian Child Welfare Act, anybody who claims to be of a certain ethnicity, uh, they would they would con the those uh, social welfare department or the judicial right. system will contact me and ask whether I want to be involved, what kind of uh, information or resources I can provide. I'm saying is the state of Vermont hasn't done that with us. It's only when I found out a child is being um, in custody that I have to actually approach to try to intervene. And a lot of times I'm hearing that you don't have standing because we don't recognize the Indian Child Welfare Act because it's for federal tribes only. But I'm just saying other states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, other people contact me all the time and ask for my input because they've extended that uh, that um, that benefit of contacting tribes to the state tribes so they don't discriminate against federal or state tribes. But Vermont hasn't extended that to to state tribes. So we don't have standing. So we don't we don't become an interested party. Does that make sense? So I'm saying is it would well, be nice if the state of Vermont might do that as part of this racial uh, disparities or racial justice. Right. No, I no, I understand how the process works. I, I guess, and I'm sure you're aware that the court doesn't independently investigate uh, cases. That information would have to come to us through DCF as they present the case. Uh, Correct through the court so i usually like what i'm saying is say somebody's dcf they're doing an investigation and they want to take custody uh or potential uh discharge parental rights if somebody identified that they had abenaki heritage usually then they would reach out to that tribe to find out if they are in fact on the tribal roles and if there is any concern about how to place the child and and whatever the case may be. I'm just saying the state of Vermont hasn't done that uh, where other others have. I know the the maybe the judicial system or the court doesn't uh, say, well, I want to research this, but it's through usually the DCF process that I'm contacted. It's by the social uh, case manager, right. the social right. welfare case manager. But then that plays into the the placement and other types of things oh, when I a think. judge makes a decision. There, there's some kind of uh, you have some kind of say on what happens. That's no, no, I, I understand that. That's why I'm concerned that if if you don't think it's being addressed, then I, I would agree with you that we need to make sure that those issues are addressed. Well, if it is, I'm not being contacted, and no one in my tribe is. So if it's happening, uh, it may be happening with somebody else, but there's no concerted effort. I'm just making the statement that those are the type of things I even get called by prisons uh inmates from prison saying they're not getting certain things or or need legal help which ask our tribe to provide which we can't because we don't have lawyers and we don't have those kind of things there's a bunch of things that i think from a native side we could work on but we don't touch on them really because or we haven't um but uh anyway i just wanted to at least say if we're going to expand the purview sure. that might be nice to include working with specific agencies directly to make policy changes or or recommend adopting certain policies to be more equitable um, in the state of Vermont, which hasn't been done in the past. That's all I'm saying. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at it. Thank you. Can I ask you, um, Chief, I'm going to ask you a fav the favor that I just asked of Pepper. Can you write me a little paragraph? Yeah, Very specifically. And, and in what regards? You mean about working about with? About looking very carefully at the, uh, what? how would I, I'm trying to remember how you worded it. Basically, 
the disjuncture between federal recognition, state recognition, and then the, a disparate application of law. Yeah, I can I can kind of write down what um, what I'm seeing and where things could be improved because no. Well, what I'm thinking of is just something briefly that I can put in in this discussion that in the testimony to say the RDAP would also like to look at these issues. Okay. That if you know, because I'm following on what Pepper was saying about the expansion, and you followed on him saying this would be part of that. So you would say, for example, the Indian Child Welfare Act, those kind of things, as exactly. an example. Yes. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. When you just let me know when you need it by, by uh, Thursday. <laughs> well, uh, like. Could we say, like, close the business tomorrow? Would that be too much to ask? Yeah, there's not a lot. I mean, I, I don't, I know the things that I know. There may be others, but I'll sure, use again, just, all others that apply as a catch all, like all additional duties as assigned type thing. Three just or four kidding. sentences. That's all I'm asking. All right. That's I'll get just, you something. I want to thank you. I just want to put this in front of the judiciary of where, you know, things that we're thinking of that if we're not being repealed, that we want directions we're thinking of going. That's all. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Other discussion? Okay, what I do wanna do though is say, if other ideas occur to you between now and really close the business tomorrow, do not think I'm getting up at 5 a.m. on Thursday and I'm gonna check my email. Please don't do that. I, please don't. Um, <laughs> If something occurs to you by close of business tomorrow of something that we think ought to be considered in our role going forward, please send it to me. I don't feel like we need to vote on it. I think we just bring it in. These are issues that we are looking at as we go forward as a body that it continues to exist. That's all. Uh, Jeff. Uh, yes, and I may be way behind the uh, the curve here, but um, I am still concerned with um, the access to a support person for our office, therefore for you. Uh, maybe that's been addressed, but if not, um, I encourage that it be done so, if for no other reason than we have seen over and over again that data has to be disconnected from profit. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Um, as I say, it will be Thursday morning at 8.30, I will shave. Um, if you've got more, please send it to me in an email. The next issue, and probably the larger one of the evening, um, is the discussion of the housing um, of the proposed Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. God, that's hard to say. Um, the bill as it now sits is basically as we saw it last month. I sent you a link in the agenda. I don't think there's a need to rehash that. Um, if you do, feel free to chime in. Uh, our concern is, however, still the recommendations for the housing of this organization, this body. Um, I'm not going to go on at length, but the ideas that we have are seven, and you have those in the email that I sent to you and, right, in the email that I sent to you. I don't remember the date. Um, the first idea, of course, was under the Office of the Executive Director, Director of Racial Equity. The second was the Agency of Digital Services. Third was a complete standalone body. Fourth, the legislature's joint fiscal office. Rebecca then sent an email where she, that she had researched and added three more to this. 
the Vermont Secretary of State, Office of the Vermont State Auditor, and the Human Rights Commission, lastly. So the matter at hand is as follows. Um, where do we as a panel want to have this proposed bureau housed? What are the issues involved in its housing? What are its needs? And where will those both best be met? Um, we spoke in that recent report from December about the need not only for accountability for this proposed body, but further for the need for the body to be politically independent. And institutionally, then, we need to ask, where is such independence most likely to be found? Um, so we have those seven options. And I had also written a sort of desperate email saying, I need help from the jurists because this is a bit beyond my skill set. Um, I had suggested in my last email that we um, sort of whittle this down as much as possible, if possible, really, um, the number of possibilities that we have. And what I suggested, and I don't know how you all feel about this, is that after this meeting, um, proponents of various locations could get together, I hesitate to say as subcommittees, but you know, something like that, and write a short paragraph again supporting their choice. Um, I would compile those and we could submit them to the legislature as a series of recommendations from this body for the location of this new bureau. That seems to me, and it certainly did when I wrote the email, most reasonable, given that I don't know that we're going to actually get to consensus on this matter. Um, and I'm not also particularly reassured of our intermeeting interaction and input. Um, we should discuss deadlines for that and so on as well. So, Pepper, you were going to have some things to say about these seven choices, were you not? Well, <clears throat> I, w I will. Uh, and what I did um, earlier today was just look at those seven choices um, that we identified and just write down from my own perspective some of the pros and cons of each. And, uh, you know, again, I, this was kind of just off the top of my head. So uh, it's more designed to be an exercise and getting a conversation going than uh, kind of having these be the, the definitive pros and cons of each. Um, but I will go through my pros and cons. And I would just note at the beginning that when, um, you know, a lot of my, I guess, cons uh, involve kind of independence from the executive branch as a theme or from the governor. And I just wanna say at the outset that I do not wanna cast dispersions on the current governor. It's really just about removing this body from kind of the political, uh, the political kind of whims of, the, of the, any given moment. Um, because I think this governor has actually been, um, you know, he's shown real support for racial equity and criminal justice reform police modernization and everything else. So this is really about kind of a hypothetical future governor. But um, so with respect to the Office of Racial Equity, if we were going to house uh, this Bureau of Racial, uh, what is it, Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics there, I think the pros of that would be um, the Bureau really could support the um, statutory duties of the Racial Equity Executive Director which you can find in 3 VSA section 5003. <laughs> um, but she, uh, she, I'll just say she, because it's we all know it's Zuzana, um, but um, she's required to identify systemic <laughs> racism in each of the three branches of state government. And she's also statutorily required to manage and oversee the statewide collection of race-based data to determine the nature and scope of racial discrimination with all systems of state government. So that is a natural um, place to put this. Um, the Office of Racial Equity also uh, statutorily is, um, has the support, uh, technical, legal, administrative support of the agency administ administration, which is um, you know, a pretty powerful uh, arm of the government. Um, it's supported by the Racial Equity Advisory Panel, which includes appointees um, by legislators, 
um, the pro tem, uh, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of kind of political capital uh, with that racial equity advisory panel. Um, and currently, um, and this could change, of course, but the office has broad political support. Um, Act 147 of last year called for an increase to the resources of the Office of Racial Equity, and the governor's um, budget um, actually funded two new positions um, for the office, including a full-time policy and research analyst um, and an education and outreach coordinator. So those are the pros of putting it there. Um, the cons that I just kind of quickly thought of are, um, you know, the uh, executive director is appointed by the governor and housed within the agency of administration. So there is potential for tension if, um, you know, the executive director disagrees or says something potentially controversial um, that doesn't uh, you know, jive with the governor's kind of agenda. Um, and putting it, housing it in the in that office also could probably could distract or consume some of the other, you know, duties of that office, which are immense, um, of course. You know, their her purview is not just criminal justice reform, it's every aspect of state government. So um so that's that. I don't know, Eitan, if you want me to just go through all of them um, or if you want me to pause for discussion after each each of the seven. I think we could pause after discussion. Um, Eitan, if I can jump in, I think sure. I indicated earlier I have to leave for another meeting. You did. Um, and Pepper, if you could, if you've got a list of those pros and cons, um, I, I'd appreciate receiving because I'm not going to be able to hear the rest of your presentation. But even before you made your comments, um, without without hearing the rest of your pros and cons for the other six, I just think the place to house this is with the equity, uh, with Susanna program. It, it to me, it, the cons that you've identified I recognize, but at the same time I think they are way outweighed by the benefits of lodging it in okay. in her office. And I just wanted to make that position clear. I, I will consider the others, but that that's great. That's my position. Good. Thank you. Good. I'm Thank sorry you. I have to leave. No, life goes on. Thank you, Judge. If you could send me that, Pepper, I'd appreciate it. Will do. Um, can I add? Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead, please. No, I was going to move on, but please. Oh, okay. I did, I did actually want to sort of go, I mean, I was going to go with the discussion thing you had suggested. Yeah. Susanna, can I ask you a question, or actually two? Um, there were the two questions that I have that really only you can answer. Um, do you really have the support that is claimed for you to have in the statute? That would be my first question. And my second one would be, how do you feel about having this bureau, which is actually three people, if in fact you have those people are doing the work that they're doing? I mean, it wouldn't be falling on you. It would be falling on these people who would make up the bureau. So would it really impact you in terms of workload? And just so that I'm clear, you mean these three people would be separate from the the two staffers proposed in this budget cycle, right? I would hope so. Yeah, you know, um, first of all, thank you for asking. <laughs> and I, if I were not in this role and somebody were to ask me, where do you think this should sit? I would probably think it, it could logically sit with the racial equity director, but I do also uh, agree very much with everything that Pepper and others have said during this conversation about the importance of independence and the importance of being able to keep this work clean for lack of a better word. So, um, so for that reason, I can understand and even maybe agree with, um, with not wanting to put it in this shop, but I guess to the actual question you're asking, um, assuming that the 
proposed budget item go through with those staff and assuming that this bureau would be adequately staffed in its own right. Um, I, I think that it would probably be enough support to, to make that work go forward. And, and, and it would actually then ask me to reconsider the role of the policy and data person that we're looking to hire. If we have three data people looking just at criminal justice data, then I wonder how that changes the role for the other sole data person. Um, and I guess those are nuts and bolts that need to be worked out if and when all that happens. But those are some okay. of the things that come to, come to mind. Thank you. Anyone else? Tyler. I'm just wondering if somewhere in here isn't a solution between the idea of our group um, and, and our relationship to Susanna's shop and wondering if that could help at all with the concerns around independence from an executive, well, yeah, an executive branch seeing as this group reports to the legislature. Uh, Rebecca. So I've, I've shared my views on this and they haven't changed, um, but I'm, I'm willing to explain a little further. Um, I think that what Pepper said initially, I wanna just state as mine as well, that none of this is personal. Uh, of course it can't be personal because Susanna Davis, you're wonderful. And and, and, and so that it's, it's not, it's more about uh, recognizing the significance of the project, and when I say that, I have to admit that even though we we've 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 brought this to being, this idea through the RDAP, with it, which its very name is racial disparities, but what is proposed in this bill is bigger than collecting even racial disparities data. I think we recognize that. So, from the long view, and the role that this data collection is going to serve for this entire system, it doesn't fit. It's already outgrown itself in terms of just, are we instinctively just looking because the name of racial equities is there? A. And so I think that if we can just sort of remove that sort of natural lean, just because, oh, it's of course it's natural. Again, removing the personalities and the, and the people are there, but the actual entity. So we're just stripping it down. A, I don't think that's a match. B, the suggestion about whether our panel could be or some other non-professional entity could organize and maintain this level of data that we're proposing, even with this, this support, it just, it's not there. It needs the weight, the gravity of what we're doing and, and data being collected. It warrants a fixed entity. And so we talked as a panel whether or not, again, and part, and again, at the core is this, holding on to the independence of it, because if at the end of the game, we can't trust the data, we can't trust how it's being used, uh, there isn't the transparency, the accessibility, the accountability, the enforcement, that incoming state agencies will do it and produce it, um, then what in this project, then what is, what is the point? So whether it's an actual independence problem or a perception problem, I think, the concerns start to merge into one, and we avoid all of that by giving it the authority, the the in, by making sure it's independent. Now, ideally, we could come up with a separate independent type of organization, not even necessarily state government. Uh, the three recommendations that I made, and I know, Eitan, you want to focus on one at a time, but it merges with what uh, where I went with the alternative. And I went to uh, the Defender General for guidance on this, given his, his time in state government, his time as a commissioner level um, pointee in the system. And of course, his role in the Defender General system. And his point is, you know, realistically, it's easier to work within something that's already existing. Realistically, it's easier to work within an organization that is state government. And then working within those parameters, he quickly identified the three that currently have the capacity to potentially um, 
take in this kind of huge project. Right? And that was the, the Secretary of State and the independents, because again, independents being elected by Vermonters. And and um, and then also the perception and reputation and all of that, given the infrastructure that's necessarily built around keeping that independence so around the voting. And all, so that was why the secretary of state was s- suggested first. Uh, the auditor's office is, is second, close second, similarly uh, aligned with the same pros. Again, the the um, the position and the role of the auditor in the state government, um, the uh, independence that that office is is given in the recognition again a natural fit for this but sm- so small that it couldn't it, it's not infrastructurally uh, built currently uh, to to ad- adjust to that but uh, that can be fixed uh, and then um, the three was the the human rights commission again and uh, in terms of again overlapping of what we're looking at that's the broader look in terms of not just racial equities, but now human rights uh, generally. So again, the independence built in there with the structure, a little bit different, not elected um, per se, but um, removed from a really close, closely linked to the governor's office, which is also one of my biggest reasons to oppose the current proposal in this bill. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Pepper, do you want to continue? Uh, sure. Um, and I guess because the Secretary of State, the State Auditor, and the Human Rights Commission were invoked, uh, and most of my pros were the ones that Rebecca just uh, enumerated, I will just go to the cons of each of those. Um, <clears throat> the Secretary of State um, the cons are it is an elected position, um, so future office holders might not support this bureau and might try and uh, defund it or just decide that it's their findings are not relevant. Um, the mission of the racial um, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics is not uh, easily aligned with the mission, the constitutional authority of the Secretary of State, which really is about overseeing elections, professional regulation, business registration, public records, and and, uh, maintaining the state archives. It it doesn't seem like a natural fit for a um, kind of policy statistics uh, bureau and analysis bureau. And the Secretary of State really uh, does not have um, the expertise in criminal justice reform or kind of a nexus with criminal justice, uh, criminal justice system, period. So those are the cons that I thought of. I mean, it, it, I'm not saying that we it, it doesn't fit there. Those are just the ones that came to mind. Um, with respect to the auditor, again, an elected position, so kind of uh, requires buy-in from whoever is currently holding the office. Um, and again, not aligned with the constitutional duties, which you can find in 32 VSA 163, uh, which are really about auditing finances of the state and ensuring compliance with federal grants. So um, I would add one pro uh, to what Rebecca said, which is that they do have audit authority. I mean, it's mostly related to finances, but they are kind of an investigative office, investigative office. Um, Human Rights Commission, uh, again, independent, deep understanding of discrimination and racial disparities. Um, But it really, uh, you know, this, what we're looking for um, is somewhat tangential to HRC's mission and their day-to-day operations. I mean, they really are about enforcing the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act and the Fair Employment Practices Act. So this would be, to me, just kind of a an appendage to them that would be totally different than the normal work that they do. So those are the cons for that. Okay. Um, Any, happy, yeah. happy to move on or or just uh, pause. I'm for, looking for to see if anyone's got thoughts or anything, but I'm not seeing any. Um, this is pretty heady stuff, so. Well, I, and I, I'm trying to like I, I'm doing You're the doing I'm trying well. to do the. You're being okay. fine. You're fine. Okay. 
So a agency of digital services um, was another suggestion. Um, the pros of, of the agency of digital services, sometimes it's just referred to as ADS. Um, they oversee all executive branch data projects and technology initiatives. Um, they have IT personnel. I, I mean, all of our IT personnel, and I think this is true of all um, executive branch agencies report to ADS. So they really could hit the ground running with respect to developing the needed infrastructure to um, like, for instance, just procuring the appropriate technology. Um, you know, all the technology asks have to run through ADS anyway. Um, they could kind of take the lead just like Kristen McClure did on uh, overseeing a data governance council, um, creating the master person index that, you know, kind of are essential to what we're talking about. Um, the cons, uh, again, this is an executive branch agency. So the uh, secretary is appointed by the governor, um, not entirely free from, you know, this kind of uh, appearance of conflict or potential conflict. Um, and uh, they, they uh, just like some of these other organizations, don't have any real expertise in the criminal justice system or racial disparity issues. Um, Pepper, can I ask something? If, sure. if, even if this were housed somewhere else other than ADS, isn't ADS going to get drawn into this somehow precisely because that's what they do is data and digital? I mean, the kind of negotiation between the data systems that we were getting all caught up in that's going to be in their wheelhouse no matter what, correct? Well, we can't get a um, a data project approved without the the approval of ADS. They have to recommend it for us. I, and so um, I would think that that's true across most of the executive branch agencies. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's true of the judiciary or the legislature, but um, I don't know. Monica, do you have any insight on, on ADS? Yeah, I mean, you know, I work with, we all work with ADF all the time in, in the executive branch. And, um, you know, my, my, my thought about ADS is, yeah, they're going to be necessary if we're going to have to have, you know, a database, um, if we need the infrastructure. Um, and if I was in, you know, a branch where they have, you know, their um, political um, app. I personally am not a fan of having it at ADS because I I think that their expertise is in infrastructure and systems, and as Pepper mentioned, it's not so much about policy and analysis, and certainly no real um, familiarity with um, criminal justice that I'm aware of, or um, you know the issues that we talk about. So we would need them, but they're certainly yeah, that's that's what they're there for, right? It doesn't mean that they we would want to house uh, the bureau there. We just know that we would have to take it. Got it. My Thank opinion. you. <laughs> okay, Pepper, you want to keep going or? Sure. So. Um, the legislature's joint fiscal office. Um, so this office already exists. Um, for the purpose of informing policy and budgetary decisions. I know that part of the racial equity task force report, um, or no, it's just the, uh, the Office of uh, Racial Equities report um, talks about equity impact statements um, that could help inform policy. You know, if the Judiciary Committee is considering, you know, a bill, you know, this office could uh, help kind of look at the data that we've collected and say how it might be impacted by this policy decision or, or that. So it already provides nonpartisan analysis on analysis on fiscal issues. Um, adding racial data analysis would not be a stretch uh, for this organization. Um, they are trusted by the legislature, you know, the, as a nonpartisan organization. So, um, you know, the, the legislature ultimately is what's going to be making the vast majority of decisions um, with respect to uh, 
you know, the recommendations. So, um, and, you know, the Connecticut model um, that a lot of our data bill was based on um, kind of treated the, this office, they put it in the Office of uh, Policy and Management in the governor's office, the, the executive branch. But you can kind of see, you know, they treat this as kind of like this helps inform policy and budget decisions. So you could see how it could go either in the governor's office, which is in charge of organizing the government, or the legislature, which gets to determine the policies. So um, in some ways, uh, you know, it, 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 it may, I could see how it would make sense in the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, the cons uh, of the JFO, um, it's uh, not really accountable to the public. It's accountable to the legislature. And um, I would say it's somewhat of an odd fit um, for for them to do this uh, when their main focus is on fit financial and fiscal policy, fit fiscal analysis. So, you know, this would be kind of stepping outside of what they normally do, but but they are they are there to serve the kind of data needs of the legislature with respect to fiscal policy. So and that uh, that's all we already did the Secretary of State, the auditor, yeah. and the Human Rights Commission. So that's, that's it. That's it. And again, this was just off the top of my head. So please, it, it was designed to spark a conversation, not to uh, be the kind of definitive list of pros and cons. Chief Stevens. Um, hey, Pepper, what do you think? Um, since all bills are passed through legislative council, what what do you do you think? I mean, they're often called upon for interpretation or what do you think about something being held or housed there? Because I mean, legislators can't turn over all the time, but legislative council is pretty steady, right? I mean, I don't know. What do you is that not something that they would probably they wouldn't be in their wheelhouse either? Or do you think that what do you think about that? I, I mean, and correct me if I'm if I'm misrepresenting what we actually want out of the Bureau of uh, Racial Statistics, uh, Racial Justice Statistics. But um, really, it's it's kind of a policy think tank, data analysis, uh, data collection and analysis group. Um, and you know that it is mostly done. It's a different skill set than Legislative Council. And Legislative Council. Um, is really a group of lawyers that are designed to ensure that uh, the laws that are being passed can um, comply with certain, you know, constitutional and other statutory requirements. It, it's to me, it's a kind of very distinct, separate thing that legislative council does than kind of data analysis and making, ultimately making, I, I guess, policy recommendations or responding to policy recommendations. I don't know if that's helpful or not, honestly, but. Yeah, I'm just curious, Kat, my only comment was, I, so where should it be housed? You know, in other words, we have a lot of pros and cons, but there doesn't sound like there's any ideal place, really. I mean, yeah. like there's a lot of pros and cons for each. So I'm just trying to think of areas, but anyway, thank you for telling me about that, Pepper. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Monica. Thanks. Well, first, I want to thank Pepper and Rebecca for the thoughtful analysis they put into this because it's just kind of helpful for me to hear and I go that deep into it. And it also, I'm thinking that there isn't a perfect place, and we had mentioned, like, oh, it's sort of out of their wheelhouse, it's out of their wheelhouse. I think what's going to happen is you're going to have to fit it into some place, and their, their authority, their responsibility. Uh, is going to need to change and then take on, you know, this, this bureau um, because it, there's no seemingly, or what well, we haven't uncovered, you know, a natural fit for it. I myself have some, you know, ones that I think could be eliminated from the list, you know, so maybe we don't have to put all all seven. And I was just curious if um, other people had something to eliminate. Um, it does feel to me like the Agency of Digital Services and the standalone idea should just go away. And I would say 
the agency of digital services should go away because they're going to be here no matter what. So we don't need to actually address that. And secondly, the standalone, as Rebecca was addressing, it's just easier to, to have some infrastructure that's already in place to attach something to. I mean, it's standalone is just, it's prohibitive on a lot of levels, it seems to me, which would take us to five. Yeah. I, see, I see that Martin uh, Lalonde yes. has his hand, hand raised. Representative, please. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys going into this because uh, this is going to be one of my big projects once we get past uh, uh, the crossover uh, this, this next week, in addition to looking at the stuff coming over from the Senate. Uh, and the way the way that I've been looking at, and I do have a question for you, but the way I've been looking at it is just trying to figure out, okay, this, there is this proposal. I, I think I understand what we're trying to ultimately do. And of course, the uh, politics rears its ugly head and 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 you're you're all not dealing with that part of it, and you're not supposed to be, and that's great. but um, so so there are there are some political difficulties with some of the suggestions and and I, I won't go into that, but I'll just let you know that I'm I'm trying to figure out the way that we are most likely going to be able to get this done. You know, that's kind of where I am uh, with this. Uh, and how that's going to happen is still a little bit up in the air, and I can see why. I mean, it's you know, from from this conversation, there's not a clear answer. So uh, it may be messy for the next uh, several weeks, but but I you know, just so you know, I'm going to be really trying to work at, for the end goal. But the question I have is the way that this seems to be set up uh, in the bill and the and in the um, the report, the recommendations is a combination of collection and analysis. And it's one way I've been pondering this a little bit as well is, is that the collection is somewhat separate. And I actually think the Agency of Digital Services is the key potentially for that. But the idea, as far as I'm looking at it, is we certainly want to instruct what data we want to have collected. And I think that's what actually the bill and the recommendation does, at least in the criminal justice area. We, we know what we want to collect. But then I think it needs to be made available for policymaking, which I'm, everybody's been talking about. But for that policymaking endeavor, it needs to be made available not only to the governor and the administration and the legislature, but readily available for the public as well for weighing in. So I'm trying to, in my mind, I'm focusing on how do we best collect the data and make it available for those different entities. And yes, maybe we want to set up the entity within uh, the director of racial justice uh, area for their purposes of anal analyzing that. We also want it available for the legislature and for the public. Th that's just some of the thoughts I'm having, you know, and, and I don't know if that helps any of the conversation we're having, but just just so you know that, you know, this, this is really appreciated, the input that you have been uh, uh, been giving and, and we'll continue to look to you all for your guidance as well. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else thoughts? Um, Rebecca. I forgot the, to mention, we should throw it out there because they have come to testify, not testify, well, to speak with us. The um, Abby Crocker, Steph, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Clark. Clark the National Restorative Justice Center. And again, I know we were talking about the possibility of this independent, faceless, nameless thing, but there is that other entity out there um, that has not yet been named tonight, who has, who's been included in the fort. So I just, I wanted to throw that out there. And I don't know if, if we wanna add that to the list. Um, not that we need a longer list, but um, in terms of just listening to what Representative Lalonde was just saying, not being privy to all of the political uh, questions and, and issues there, but in terms of thinking about all the things you're trying to address in the bill, but particularly um, the analysis side, the collection side, I mean, they are the experts. I mean, there are CRG 
And then we also have learned about what UVM is doing in terms of that kind of level and the capacity they potentially could have, um, the funding sources. Perhaps that's an answer there. Um, and I just want to make sure that's not being ignored. So if I could just real quickly, yeah, that 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 I, I should have mentioned them. That is definitely one of those entities that I see as getting the data from from the from the state and being able to work with that data to to help form po policy. So so thank you for reminding me of that, uh, Rebecca. Yeah. Yes, a longer list. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> No, really, we needed to put them in. I, um, you know, one of the issues, one, what we might just do, I mean, I'm okay, hold on. I'm going to table that for a moment. Sheila, go. <laughs> so same stuff, different day. I just want to echo what Rebecca is saying. And Pepper, I really, actually really appreciate um, your your knowledge and your research and your presentation that you were giving us. And Rebecca, for your um, options as well. This is exactly what I needed. And I loved how you said it was heady stuff because I'm just like, okay, I'm not responding because I'm trying to take it all in. And I'm just like, yeah, so I'm just taking it all in. And it just comes back to the same stuff to where I feel like we go in round and round and round and to ultimately discover the same thing. And so I just want to go back to what Rebecca said was that we, it sounds like we need something independent. I'm voting for something independent. That's what I want to do. I feel as though that there are many reasons why we could put many uh, pros that we could use to put it with regards to different entities that we've discussed today, but overall it still comes down to the same thing, is about the power, the political will, the conflict. We've named so many different things with regards to the cons with it not being independent. And the whole point of having something like this is so it can be accountable, can have the oversight, it can have basically the cred that it needs to as part of its effectiveness. And I, I don't, I really, I really appreciate you, Rebecca, continuing to say that because if we don't, I, I feel like if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And I feel like it's broken. And I feel like we need something new and different. And it sounds as though we are going to need resources wherever this is, because it's a new branch, a new thing, a new this, and every single pro has then been followed up with, well, it doesn't quite align, or the mission does that, or we would have to create new positions, or it'd be totally, like it still is really creating almost an independent thing within a thing. And I understand that sometimes that can be sort of easier to do, like to have a roommate rather than to go get your whole own apartment. I get that. Um, and sometimes having a roommate brings back to your childhood, brings back to your college days, brings back to that relationship that you wish you had gotten out of sooner than later. So. Um, I would like to get out of this relationship sooner than later and to have some independence from the government, from the political ways, from people who choose not to believe in racial justice. I would like us to continue to move forward in that conversation of like maybe the conversation is how can we start looking at if this is independent, what conversation do we need to have for that? And then I just want to say, I'm really appreciative, Chief Don Stevens, that you're on here because we almost always forget about indigenous people and native people. We almost always are not, even though we're talking about racial disparities, even though we're talking about BIPOC, we often do not get into the nitty gritty and we invisibilize and we are conditioned and swimming in the pool of the sea of just like, oh, we don't really talk about it, so it doesn't get really get mentioned, so it just keeps going around and around. So I am very appreciative of you having your voice here and expressing what you are, um, because I can't do that. And I think we need um, you and more people and for us to be listening more um, of the other aspects of this racial justice work that we need to be doing. Thank you. I, looking at 732, we are certainly, I mean, we've, we've, we've added another option. Um, but I do, th I think that the conversation's been really fruitful, as Representative Lalonde says. And I think we may, no matter what you've said, 
Sheila, we're going to have people who are going to be on the other side of this. And maybe what we're going to need to do is simply submit a list. Because I don't, it may not be possible to whittle it down much further. I'm going to just say that much. That that's where my suggestion is going. That we submit a list to the legislature and they're going to have the conversations they're going to have. We're going to probably be asked to weigh in further on it, as will people from these various organizations. I'm hoping including the Center for Restorative Justice people. So I'm just putting that out there that I didn't want anyone to think that I thought that the conversation, oh, well, here we are. Didn't get anywhere. I don't mean that. I think the conversation is very important, but I'm not sure it's going to produce what I was hoping. I don't even know why I was hoping that. That was ridiculous. Feedback? A list, maybe? Just a list? Well, I was, I was thinking, oh, maybe a list of pros and cons, but then I thought, mm, maybe we don't even actually agree on the pros and cons of each one of these options. I conversation. But may, it's possible we could um, include that, like, the list of questions and concerns that we would suggest the legislature look at. I don't even know. But... Maybe doing what Pepper did and actually yeah. formalizing that as a as yeah. a submission. Tyler. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I oh. don't know that everybody agrees with his pros and cons. I, I mean, I thought. Well, other people can have pros and cons. Sure, of yeah, course. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, Tyler. So I'm wondering if this list. Um, is assuming that both these, I, I'm really appreciating what Representative Lalonde put out there and saying that there's really kind of two sides of this equation when we think about the data collection and the analysis as distinct parts from one, other, one another. So when we start asking questions about this list that we're proposing, is this list assuming that both those elements are housed in the same place still? Um, and do we need to entertain more conversation about what it looks like, what it could look like, how it could be built if we looked at those parts distinctly from one another. Okay. Not to get us farther into it with, you know, dwindling minutes. <laughs> well, we're, there's no way we're going to, yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Um, David. Um, I left my hand up, although I think uh, Monica actually said what I was getting at, which was not, not, I think it might be useful not so much to have a pros and cons list because I agree that we may not actually be able to agree on the pros and cons list, but rather to have just three or four sentences summarizing the animating concerns that I think we've heard tonight. And I, we've got some minutes that hopefully can help summarize that. And I think it's just uh, independence, trust in the results and competence to do the job. Um, and, you know, that there might be a couple others in there that that we can distill out of the minutes. But I think those were sort of like, this is what I hear and what I think I've been here, what we've all been hearing from the comments tonight. And just submitting that to the legislature is like, this is the RDAP has a list, couldn't agree, didn't quite know where to go with, to go with it. But these are the concerns that we hope are driving your decision making. Okay. My... I hmm, thinking, and then there's what Tyler just brought up, which like throws this all back to do no Tyler, don't get weird. Uh, do we need to also have a discussion about whether the different functions of this are housed in the same place? Monica. Well, I will say when I first read the bill um, and then we had a conversation at our last meeting, um, I think we decided we weren't going to sort of talk about that part of, part of the bill, um, which um, 
I will say from my personal reading of it, um, it's fraught with a lot of concern and there's a whole lot of questions I have about what's in there and how functionally it would need to happen. And maybe that's where Tyler is coming from as well. Um, and that might be something that um, the committee needs, needs to take up. And, and I'm not sure we want to we want to get into that um, because the way I read it, data is just going to magically appear in this bureau, um, uh, and um, they're going to have everything that they want to do, um, analyze. And we all know in practice that um, that's far from the truth in terms of being able to happen. Um, so. Um, I guess we would need to have a separate conversation around what we think that looks like, but I'm not sure we want to get into that right now. When we were, but I thought we were just focused on the whole bureau piece because I think we all have a lot of different opinions on the other. Okay, Chief Stevens. Uh, yeah. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Sheila for uh, for what you said. I appreciate it. Um, but other than that, I think one of the things I'd like to add in, in regards to what David was mentioning is authority, because it doesn't really matter if they're separate or together. It's whoever's doing this needs to have the authority, say, for ADS to actually put this as a priority and to actually create the, the, the data uh, that they need. Because what I heard before is that ADS has to actually come to you and approve it, not the other way around. You're not saying, hey, ADS, I need this. And they're, you're actually getting their approval to actually put you on the list, right? And you can see how that could shove down uh, where this doesn't become high on their list and, and it doesn't happen. So I think, A, there needs to be authority to work with ADS to capture those fields. You need the authority to work with someone to analyze the data. So, and you also need the financial resources to carry those things out. So I think I would like to, would David add those two things, like whoever this is, has the authority to work with the people needed and has the resources, uh, whether they have it themselves or they can get it from the department that they have the authority to work with. So it might be like, you don't have to maybe fund someone to do the uh, data collection, but you may need to be able to say, ADS, I want you to do this, and, and we're willing to, to to that to come out or however that's budgeted. So it, you know what I'm saying? They may not, maybe there's a, a mechanism to be able to fund that uh, or at least put it out of somebody's budget, but without directly saying I have to have my own separate piece of money. I don't know, but I'm thinking authority and supporting the resources needed to do it, however that is. Thanks. David, I'm wondering whether, given that you're already writing this out in the minutes, whether the smartest thing to do would be for you to, to formalize that, since you're already underway on that, um, and then we send it out to everyone and we get comments back. Because I don't see, at I mean, I, I'm again doing timekeeping that with 18 minutes to go, this is going to go any further than more comments, which is fine. But 18 minutes, and if we're going to keep doing that, they could be written down, compiled, and sent out again. So I think that's what I am going to sort of suggest here is that I take your minutes when you get this done, send it out. People comment on it. We get it back. We do that process because I don't think with 18, now 17 minutes, it's going to become clearer. And that's not a failing. I'm not saying it that way. I'm just saying structurally, logistically, reasonably. So my proposal would be that I do that, I guess. that work for people? Let's do the thumbs again. Okay. All right. That's what we'll do. I think, but that leaves us then with time 
to consider what Tyler's bringing up, which is these two functions and whether they really do belong in the same place. I was just assuming they did and don't really have anything to say. So if someone were looking at me right now and saying discussion, I would just be silent because I have to think about it. <laughs> I was just assuming they did go to the same place. Tyler. So I think part of my thinking around there is this might be an easier pickle to get ourselves out of on one side of the equation. When I think of something like data collection, it starts to make more sense to have like an auditor um, or office of the auditor saying just the data is supposed to be collected in said way and we have the authority to audit. Are you collecting the data in the way that is dictated you should be doing it? Mm -hmm. um, it's the analysis part that gets really tricky because I really appreciate what um, Chief Stevens just brought up about authority being pretty crucial yeah. to this. But I feel like there is um, almost like a, a, a teeter-totter. There's a fulcrum in the middle, and on one side of that, we have independence. On the other side of that, we have authority. And as you veer towards a more independent agency, it feels to me, maybe this is a bias of, of mine or something, but it feels to me as it becomes more independent that it has the potential to lose capacity for authority. And so that's the challenge, and really it's around how are you analyzing that data that we, that, that that's, that feels to me like that's the more complicated part of this equation. Okay, thanks. Rebecca? I think the current structure of the proposed bill right now using the racial equities office as the body, but if it changes to one of the seven that we send up, and, and Tyler, as you're talking about, um, in terms of the how-to, the experts who can do the analysis, seems to me that that's where, if say you just use the auditor's office, right? Say, say the three positions, two positions that will be uh, funded within that, that collection auditor's office, they could contract out with the experts. Again, let's just say the UVM um, VLS crew, right? And so that that becomes the way to bring in ease, easily. But I mean, in terms of how to deal with it, I don't know if we need to um, do that level of detail again, though. It's great to have Representative Roland here, and if 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 you what if he's not hearing anything that would be useful for him in terms of recommendations, hopefully he'll 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 chime in and and suggest what he'd like in terms of you know specifics. But it seems to me that's a way to get around that question or concern, Tyler. Um, Chief Stevens. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, I think Tyler hit it on the head, and I think uh, if you think about it, um, common sense wise, uh, if you're when you collect data, the data is the data, right? You're not changing the data; you're just collecting data. So if you get the right data that you're trying to collect, it's pretty stagnant, right? Then you walk, you go over to Rep. Uh, Lalonde's position. Where, as in, if it's available to the racial equity director, they can they can farm that data however they want to compile it. Uh, the public can do the same thing, and so can the legislators. So then it doesn't matter because as long as you collect the data that you want, different people can massage it the way they want to, or um, or the, what they need it for. And then it really doesn't become as critical, right? Because you know you're going to have data analysis within the racial equity because of the new positions. I mean, the state police people have that that analyze their data, right? So I mean, we have we can have somebody analyzing data specifically for racial disparities, but you could also have uh, it being available for the legislators want to know something or the public. So I I think. As long as we maybe if we focus on the collection of the right data that different people could use, maybe that's the answer, right? I mean, you know, but give the authority or the the uh, resources to be able to have those different analysts to be able to, to to collect that data. Does that make does that make sense, or am I out of the the realm of uh, what we're thinking? I'm not sure. Representative Lalonde, I, 
<laughs> well, first of all, to answer Rebecca's question, yeah, this is helpful, uh, and what you're planning on giving is helpful. Uh, and, but I, I do also understand bottom, uh, at the bottom, there needs to be resources put towards the data collection and the analysis. And whether that is in one body or as I kind of opened this up and I apologize, in, in two separate entities, you know, there do have to be resources, you know, it has to be resources there. And I do recognize that part, but so, but this is helpful. Where? I'm a little bit of a loss. What to do with this one? That, that was a, that was something I didn't anticipate, and now I'm not sure what to do with it. I, I'm like fine with where we got with David, and now I'm not quite certain. Rebecca, I, I was I was just gonna say I thought your an earlier idea still works, which I understood to okay. be once David uh, writes these uh, these minutes up and sends them out, and we approve or or that that somehow we can pull all the suggestions of what we think is critical to have. Um, and then the seven or whatever the number is, um, and somehow put that together as the All right. I, I, uh, good. That's what we're doing then. And I'll just get it out. As soon as David gets that to me, I will, I will work on that. Somehow there will be another day this week. It'll be Aton day to do the panel work. <laughs> um, I will get that out as soon as possible then. Are there other issues people want to discuss right now? Okay. Um, thank you. This has been very fruitful. Um, we are obviously not doing the discussion of readings. <laughs> Yet again, sorry guys, uh, we will get there obviously, but not tonight and likely, well, possibly in the ne at the next meeting, which is on the 13th of April. Is there new business that anyone would like to bring up? Okay, again, the next meeting is on Tuesday, the 13th of April. Um, second Tuesday of April, just before tax day, Rebecca. Before we lose uh, the sites, Julio, I think you just put in maybe two hours ago, <laughs> uh, some sites, are those, the, are those, is this new information you want us to observe? I know I'm not going there tonight, but for next month, these hyperlinks, Julio, are you still here? I inserted it when Susanna was talking about taking a look at police related issues. Um, these two these two resources, which are put out by the leadership conference, I think have, they were put out about 18 months ago uh, relating to community. One of them is a 480 page detailed dive into different issues of police reform related issues, including some that Susanna mentioned, like body worn cameras, et cetera. The other one is more of a community toolkit. It's about 100 pages about how to get communities involved. It's more tactical um, than, than uh, detailed. Uh, and the reason I mention them now is I think they might have more, uh, you know, more topical currency than they did say six months ago because the, uh, the executive director of the leadership conference is Vanita Gupta, who was before the Senate today is likely to be, um, you know, the number two or three in the justice department. Um, and also the, uh, lawyer who worked with uh, um, her on this project, Linda Garcia, just took a job uh, as uh, Cory Booker's chief legal counsel at a time where the George Floyd uh, Justice, Policing, Justice and Policing Act is over in the Senate. Um, and I think these two documents will give you, may give us, uh, you know, an, an insight into what's going on on the federal level, which includes, and that and that law includes things that are of interest to all this, like use of force reporting, uh, standards relating to um, accountability and the like. So I think it is, I, I just thought the timing, you know, coincided with what Susanna mentioned. And 
um, these these two people are now in positions in the new administration. Well, I guess uh, Senator Booker's been there for a while, but um, but they're you know they work together, and I I would expect to see. Um, I think this will shed some light on what we might see on the federal front. So that's why I thought it was timely. Thank you, Julio. Sure. Anybody else? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Okay. Anyone want to second it? Second. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 All opposed? You're opposed, David. Okay. Uh, oh, no, that was all right. Great. We are in adjournment. I will see you. We are adjourned. Take care. I will see you all in April, but I will be in email contact long, long before then. Again, just as a reminder, um, if you want to be on my text list to send to people for notifications for when I am testifying, please send me an email with your phone number. That was thanks to Sheila. Great. See you all later. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.